Welcome food fans, picky eaters, the flavor curious, and everyone in between. Nothing makes good food better than good conversation. And your table is ready. Come right this way to the Food for Thoughtcast with your host, Melissa Reagan. But you can call her chef. All right, let's get this episode started. Hi, and welcome back to the Food for Thought cast with me, your host, Melissa Reagan. This is episode 15 of the Food for Thought cast. We are talking about coming to terms, specifically menu terms. This is part one of two. This will be a two-part episode. Have you ever been to a restaurant and not understood what you were reading on the menu? Have you ever read a menu description and been really disappointed when the food that you were served didn't match? What are the terms you should know and why? Why do chefs use some words rather than others? This is today's Food for Thought. Grab a seat. You got here just in time to discuss wordsmithing. One of my favorite food jokes, if you've been listening to the show, you already know it. And if this is your first time joining in, thank you so much for listening. You ready? One of my favorite food jokes is, what is the difference between mashed and whipped potatoes? In cooking, it really comes down to a potato masher and a wire whisk. But on a menu, the difference is about $3. Sometimes it's the words that make all the difference. Words like artisan, rustic, dust, crumble, snow. Terms like farm to table, local, heritage, heirloom, sustainable. All of these words invoke a feeling in whoever's reading them. Maybe it's excitement. Maybe it's confusion. Maybe it's apathy. Maybe indifference. Also sometimes anger or annoyance. But if the old adage is true, that we eat with our eyes first, then I think a menu is automatically the first taste of your entire meal. Maybe you don't interact much with the menu terminology. Perhaps you've never given any thought to the fact that you're being sold something. Perhaps you have a regular or usual item at your local place that you frequent that you enjoy so much you don't even read the rest of the menu. Whatever the case may be, I've been on both sides of this, so let's talk about it. First of all, in my opinion, the term farm to table has gone from a rare special treat to something that is overused in order to sell more food. Farm to table simply means food that goes directly from the farm to the table where you're eating without any middleman, such as marketplace, grocery store, or warehouse. This seems fairly self-explanatory. But the problem is that all food comes from a farm of some kind in reality, unless it's been cultured in a lab or petri dish right? Which isn't too far out there considering the technological advances that we're making. And we're not too far off from this, but as of now, it remains a work in progress. There is no universally agreed upon criteria for defining farm to table. A few things are set in stone, however. All meat in the United States has to be inspected by the USDA or Federal Department of Agriculture. This means even if your favorite local restaurant serves meat on their menu that comes from a local farm, now sometimes If you see the word local on a menu, it means down to the county or the city. And sometimes the word local refers to the state. So for instance, I live in Texas. And if I see the word local on a menu, it could mean the entire state of Texas. That's another word that doesn't have any regulation. And it really just depends on who's writing that menu. So if if your favorite local restaurant serves meat on their menu that comes from a local farm or a ranch, you recognize that there's a high chance that that meat had to travel a good distance to be processed or even inspected unless they're slaughtering and butchering the meat on the grounds of that farmer ranch. Uh, The person that's considered responsible for starting the farm to table movement is chef Alice Waters from Chez Panisse in California. She opened the first recognized farm to table restaurant in 1971. And it's kind of considered the gold standard for that kind of concept. Now, Chez Panisse featured fresh, locally grown ingredients as part of their seasonal menu 
Alice Waters was inspired by the sustainable community food structure she enjoyed when she lived in France. And she was inspired by the slower food movement that came after the 50s and 60s. So in the 1950s and 1960s in the United States, we kind of had this boom of convenience in frozen foods. She wanted to move away from that. It was the golden age of processed foods. Swanson produced the first ever TV dinner. And there was this post-war prosperity boom that caused a surge in fast food dining, convenience methods, convenience uh, foods themselves, and then all electric kitchens encouraged homemakers and home cooks to celebrate convenient cooking. A surplus in canned foods made everything more accessible to the average consumer. And then by the 1960s, the nation was almost entirely dependent upon highly processed food products, cans, boxes, and frozen. So in a response to this, Chef Waters wanted to start something different that had never been done before. Thus, here we are, farm to table movement or farm to table restaurant. Currently on a menu, uh, if you see the word farm to table, it's going to signal that, that the restaurant's prioritizing where the food comes from instead of relying solely on broadline distributors, right? They're not getting it from big box stores, uh, any of the main, you know, food, large food vendors with the recognizable names, you know, that you'll see here in the United States. But just like anything else, I would be a little bit wary of menu buzzwords that don't come with quantifiers. So absolutely don't be afraid to ask questions. If it's important for you to know the kind of journey that your food has taken or where it comes from, or what we've mentioned in previous episodes of the Food for Thought cast, right? If it's important for you to engage thoughtfully with your food supply and to know uh, what's really driving all these words on a menu or to understand what it took for that food to make it to your plate, don't be afraid to ask questions because at the end of the day, it's your food and it's your, there really are some meaningless menu words out there too. It bugs me um, a ton when restaurants use the word chef driven to describe their menu. Like, okay, if you have a chef or even if you're a chain or a franchise, then your menu is still chef driven. It's just coming down to mincing words here. Whether it's the chef on the property where the menu is written or it's a regional chef, research and development chef at a, at a national level or the state level or even a corporate chef, like there's still a chef involved. And to me, it just seems kind of silly. There are some buzzwords and menu terms and fads that continue to be overused on menus. Uh, remember, this is just my opinion, but if you if you love these words, if you love seeing these words and they hold some special meaning for you, then that's amazing. But when a menu says the word rustic and something comes out and it's just poor knife cuts or it just kind of looks sloppy or thrown together, a little bit unrefined, right? I think the intent behind the word rustic is not necessarily culinary in nature. I think it's really just descriptive and it depends on the context. So for example, if you're in a more fine dining restaurant or even a semi-fine dining restaurant, to me, the word rustic, when I see it on a menu, I'm just like, mm, I think this kind of denotes that they're throwing together something with a little bit less care. Maybe it's deconstructed, which is probably my least favorite menu word ever. Hear me when I say, I, I understand the things that chefs are trying to do when they write menus, but some other people in the restaurant are involved in writing the menus. Also, uh, there's nothing wrong with the terms that we use. You know, there's no denying that they can evoke feelings in us. Uh, they can inspire the person reading the menu to use their imagination. They can link us to strong food memories, descriptive words, and descriptions on menus can even tap into deeper issues that we're passionate about, you know, like food movements, food trends, causes that we care about, or maybe conditions that we have to live with. So when I see the word deconstructed on a menu, so when I see the word deconstructed on the menu, it can go one of two ways, right? It's either an extremely thoughtful dish that's being presented to me in a new way. For example, let's use a crab cake as an example. Typical crab cake, you'd have mayonnaise or mustard, a binder of some kind, eggs or breadcrumbs or both. You could have both mayonnaise and mustard. There's going to be crab, your crab meat. There's going to be all the, the little components that act as the flavoring for that crab meat, right? You might have scallions. You might have chives. Maybe there's some red onion in there. It just depends on what part of the country you're in. Herbs and then whatever seasonings salt and pepper, and then the list goes on after that. Just depends on your preference and what type of crab cake, 
right? If it's Southern or more Maryland style. So when you order a crab cake, you know, you're going to receive one or two little crab cakes, right? Or a patty. It's just not as appealing to say the word patty, but that's what we're talking about, right? It's going to look like a patty. It's going to look like a croquette. It's going to be presented in, in some way that it's cohesive and it's all put together one or two pieces, depending on where you're dining. If you ordered a deconstructed crab cake, it could be something like a chilled crab that's served separately by itself. And then all those other menu components are served in some other way, just sitting across the plate from it. So we could be talking about maybe a different take on the dish entirely, right? You could have a little chilled crab presented in a classic way for a cold presentation as some sort of citrus, a little stone ground mustard, maybe a mayonnaise or an aioli. And you could do something different for the bread component. Maybe it's served with crackers that you eat the crab on. It would kind of be like a really sloppy deconstruction. Or maybe there's a specialty, a cornbread crouton, for example, or some other way to imagine this, this dish, right? And it seems kind of strange. And that's why I don't really vibe with the word deconstructed. I just feel like if you're going to give me the dish, give me the dish. I've seen this be both good and bad, really inventive, imaginative ways represent or, you know, redefine what that dish looks like. And then other times I'm like, I don't understand the purpose of this, but yet to each their own, right? Like if you find something on a menu that you absolutely love and you just go, "Mm, I didn't really have to put this much thought into it. I mean, if you never really took a moment to go, what are they trying to convey here? What kind of story are they trying to tell? then excellent. There's really no right or wrong here, but I just want you to understand what some of the menu words mean, where they come from, and you know how to approach these terms when you're out to eat, when you're reading a menu. One of the things that you know I notice a lot on very high-end fine dining menus is that descript- descriptive words become filler. For example, if I order something that has a crumble or a dust and somebody's taken a solid food and used it to garnish other food, and there's really no meaning behind that. I just, ugh, I just hate that. It seems so silly. It seems contrived. It really seems like a waste of time. So I'll give you an example. If I were to order a soup, and let's say that it came with a corn dust, or that's the description that I read on the menu. I won't name the place, but that is an actual experience that I have had. And I received the soup and it had extremely dry cornbread crumbled on top. It's just fanciful words with, there's just zero purpose for including the foods that are made that way. It just seems odd. You see a lot of menu wordsmithing come, coming down to what kind of message the restaurant is trying to get across. Are they trying to say, we included this item in a dish because we're healthy? Are they trying to say that they're sourcing food in a sustainable way? Are they trying to convince us that they're operating from a place of integrity? Are they being transparent? What are the words that we're noticing, right? Like, what are they trying to sell to us? And and how is the story being told? Do they want us to know that they're promoting veganism, niche foods, trendy foods, heirloom crops? Is it organic? Are they giving credit to where the food comes from because they're supporting local businesses, or are they just saying that something's local because some consumers consider this to be more valuable, more approachable, they consider it to be more desirable. And, you know, as a consumer, as a person who's reading a menu, what makes you want to eat something more on a menu? Is it knowing where it's from or how it's made? For example, maybe you're scouring a menu for the words gluten-free because you require foods without gluten, maybe due to an allergy or a medical condition. Maybe you've gone gluten-free for other reasons, but whatever the case may be, this is a pretty common menu buzzword to the point where a lot of menus will describe foods that have always been gluten-free as gluten-free by using special graphics, a visual key or, or subscript, because they know that this term is really, really desirable to a lot of consumers. And so they're trying to drive that traffic on purpose. 
Okay, I don't need a restaurant to tell me that yogurt is gluten-free when it's always been gluten-free. This is not like a new discovery, but it's it's all about what's important to you. Do you care about where your food comes from? And it's not a good or bad, right? It's not a right or wrong. It's really a spectrum of what works for you. If you don't care about where it comes from, that doesn't make you a bad person um, by any means, right? But the menus are being written a certain way for a certain reason. Do certain places make you excited when you see them on a menu? Is it really important to you that your steak is from Snake River Farms, for example? They originated in Caldwell, um, Idaho. Does it really matter to you that your salmon comes from Copper River? That is to say that it's Alaskan. Do you care if your chicken is from Smart Chicken uh, in the heart of the Midwest? This is air chilled chicken. What sets it apart is that a lot of grocery store and a broadline distributor chicken is pumped up with saline where this is air chilled and it will actually plump when you cook it rather than losing liquid. It's just all about the way that it's processed and stored. Do you prefer American made wines? Do you prefer American cultivated and grown products? What about heritage pork, like the Berkshire pig? The Berkshire pig, for example, it's the oldest identifiable hog breed. It dates back to England in the 1600s, where it was rumored to have been discovered by Sir Oliver Cromwell. You might have seen it on a menu. This is what it's referring to. It's really rich and succulent. It's really, really clean tasting. But if you saw this on a menu, would it make a huge difference to you? Like, would you be more apt to order a pork item if you saw that it was Berkshire? Um, maybe you're passionate about issues like fair trade practices or responsibly sourced crops, organic foods. Maybe you are passionate about uh, movements like clean eating or slow food movements. Maybe you are uh, passionate about things like foraging and wild caught, sustainable fishing practices. What is sustainable fishing, right? Like what is sustainable seafood talking about? What is this bird talking about when we see it? On a menu. So, according to the Ocean Wise Seafood Program, seafood is the primary source of food for over 1 billion people. However, four out of 10 fish are caught by bycatch. That means that that fish was the unintentional catch of whatever fishing project happens. This is bycatch. It means something else got caught in a net that they weren't intending on, on catching. And if they weren't intending on catching this certain kind of fish, a lot of times they will cull it, or that is to say it will be killed or wasted, which hurts certain fish species that are vulnerable to being overfished or overexploited. Um, 85% of the world's fish, according to OceanWise, are overexploited at full capacity. So what that means is that nature supply cannot keep up with the demand. So the sustainable seafood movement began in the 1990s. Um, it all started with the collapse of the Grand Banks cod fishery and the supply of cod at Canada's Grand Banks. It really shined a light on, you know, protecting our wild food sources. Not only that, but when you protect those wild food sources, you protect jobs as well. Over 35,000 fishermen and plant workers from over 400 coastal communities lost their jobs after the collapse of that wild food source, right? So it's kind of a holistic view of, is the fish that we are buying and fishing for abundant enough to allow us to keep fishing for it, right? Are people managing this in the way that it limits damage to marine or aquatic habitats, reefs, for example, right? Are we limiting bycatch on things that are non-target. So when they say it's non-target, if they're fishing for, you know, we'll say smelt with a net, are they accidentally catching um, more endangered and, you know, more at-risk uh, species with a net? And then what what are they doing with that afterwards? So that's just a little look into what it means when they say that you're, you know, when a menu says that their seafood is sustainable, Maybe you want to support a local farm or a ranch that you have a connection with, right? Maybe it's really important that a farmer or a rancher that you personally know, maybe you know that their food is being used on a menu near you and you want to support them. I think that's an amazing way to support a local business by proxy. 
And then on the other hand, maybe you stay away from foods that have been identified by previous buzzwords that might have lost their buzz to you. Maybe farm raised leaves a bad taste in your mouth. See, I love food puns. You see what I did there? Maybe you've seen the word farm raised so many times that it means nothing to you. Uh, maybe the word flash frozen was desirable at some time in our you know, nation's history of how menus are written, right? Maybe the word flash frozen used to signal quality to you, but now you stay away from it because you don't want anything that was previously frozen. I would love to hear from the listeners about what your favorite and least favorite menu words are. Which ones inspire you? Which ones excite you? Which ones confuse you? Which ones even amuse you? One example for me is generous portion. What exactly is the implication here? Does that mean that every other portion on the menu or every other portion in the history of portions is selfish and it's so relative, right? What's considered generous? Uh, Signature items. What does this actually mean? Signature for whom? Um, Artisanal. Artisanal is just a word that means made by hand. And when you think of artisanal trades, you are thinking of like blacksmithing and, you know, cloth textiles and artisanal bread making, things like pickling, preserving, canning. All of these are artisanal methods, but I think that menus overuse this word and it doesn't actually mean in every context what it should mean. Um, Award winning is one that makes me giggle. Unless you're listing the award underneath the menu item, then where is it? Is it hanging on the wall next to your table? Is it posted near the front door? Maybe it's near the bathrooms. I just think it's silly. That one just makes me laugh. Um, It's all about the story that the menu is trying to tell. At the end of the day, there are a lot of instances where there's no truth in the advertising. Uh, For example, about one fifth of the fish in restaurants and markets is mislabeled. This comes from a study by the conservation group Oceana. Uh, According to U.S. News and World Report, one of the biggest examples of this is red snapper. This is the term that is most commonly used to mislabel fish in the United States with 87% of snapper being falsely branded. There are a lot of different species of snapper. Uh, That means for every 120 red snappers sold, uh, only seven are actually honestly labeled. This includes imported fish labeled as locally sourced and then vulnerable species sold as sustainable catches. And then it also includes lower value species such as Pangasius, for example, marked as sea bass. That's one of the biggest menu misnomers is sea bass. America imports about 90% of its seafood and the government only tracks the fish that goes from the boat to the American border. Little interesting piece of trivia, right? However, once it's in the United States, like there are not really many programs that are monitoring the products after after it comes onto the United States soil. So for regular fish fishmongers, the term whitefish usually refers to a really broad category of mild white fleshed fish like flounder, halibut, hake, or sole, not to be confused with whiting, which is completely different, but you'll often see this term used as an umbrella term to refer to all types of fish, which isn't true. You will usually see the term white fish used as a (laughs) catch-all, there's another food pun, to refer to a whole group of fish that are not actually considered white fish. Uh, A little fun menu trivia for you. Canadian bacon is a complete misnomer. Only place where it's referred to as such is the United States. Canadian bacon probably got its name in the mid-1800s, when there was a shortage of pork in the UK and they imported the meat from Canada. So they would cure the back meat in a special brine, which Canadians and lots of other countries call pea mill bacon. The English smoked it and the Canadians don't do this. And then the new concoction was referred to as Canadian bacon for whatever reason. It got this name and then it stuck just like so many other things. Americans really liked it and took it back to the States. Thus Canadian bacon was born. What about the word Danish? Uh, Danishes were actually created by Austrian bakers. In 1990s, all of a sudden people wanted to eat quote unquote healthy. So there were all these new buzzwords that had to be invented to let you know that the food 
that you were eating off the menu was not going to kill your heart and liver and was actually good for you. Uh, this includes huge booms in the use of the words wholesome, fresh, and natural, which have no governing regulations whatsoever. And they can be so broadly defined that they mean nothing by the time you see them on, the, on a menu. It's so important to know about your food, where it comes from and how it's prepared. But at the end of the day, it's really up to you. There's some different approaches to menu writing that I want to discuss. There's a very minimalist approach where let's say, for example, you're ordering a steak dinner and it simply says something to the effect of watercress, ribeye, frites, right? It could be separated by little dashes, maybe dots, maybe a comma. It just depends on how stylized the menu is, what kind of menu is, and what kind of place it is, right? So they've listed these three items and they're kind of leaving the interpretation of this dish up to you, your imagination and your menu knowledge. And you kind of have to put it in its own context. Instead of telling you the ribeye is certified Angus from the Midwest, it's a 14 ounce pan seared. It comes with Belgian style frites. We've seasoned them with Himalayan pink salt. There's a black garlic and chai flour rui and a small watercress and first day salad with Meyer lemon vinaigrette. Or maybe, you know, you prefer even more poetry, right? Like this is where the storytelling comes in. Maybe you want to know that your steak's mother's name was Bertha. The farmer's name was Brian and it was slaughtered on a Wednesday. It's going to be briefly kissed by cast iron, hand carved, and then gently nestled on a whimsical bed of forage greens and then partnered with potatoes and dancing with an infused mayonnaise that we made in house. Really, I know this sounds silly, but this is where we're at. You either have all or nothing when it comes to a menu. Does it matter to you how descriptive it is? Does it matter to you what terms are used? Um, you know, at the end of the day, consider what you want and need. There's no wrong answer here. Um, but most of all, enjoy your meal. I hope that this helps you, you know, navigate some terms on menus and maybe have a behind the scenes look at how these terms came to be. I hope this gives you a little bit of at least entertainment and a little education as always about the words that are used on menus and why. I want to tell you about a special promotion that the Food for Thought cast is running throughout the month of June. Previously on an episode featuring Kennedy Bauer as our guest, we highlighted the North Texas Food Bank and the work that they do to fill in the gap when it comes to food scarcity and food deserts. And really, you know, making sure that everybody can eat and nobody goes hungry when there's not enough food to go around. During the month of June, I'd like to challenge all of our listeners to really take it to the bank, that is the food bank, wherever you live. If you visit www.foodforthoughtcast.com forward slash blog forward slash take it to the bank where you live, you'll see a blog post there that helps you find state-specific resources about how to help now, all throughout the month of June, I would love to see submissions from listeners of a screenshot of a donation that you've made to your local food bank or local food charity. Of course, please edit out any important banking information or personal information. All I need to see is your name and the amount. By the end of the month of June, I'm going to personally match the highest donation here for the North Texas Food Bank. Not only that, but the person who donates the most wherever they may live, is going to receive a box full of Food for Thought cast swag, as well as a signed copy of Chef Stephen Gonzalez's book, Get Your Grub On. So I think this is going to be a very exciting promotion for the month of June, and I encourage you to get involved. You can send screenshots to our direct messages at Food for Thought cast on Instagram or the Food for Thought cast on Facebook. You can also send contest submissions to foodforthoughtcmc at gmail.com. Remember, you have the entire month of June to determine how much you'd like to give, how involved you'd like to be, where you live. I think this is going to be a great way to not only encourage you to help fight hunger locally where you are, but also I hope that our listeners can really drive the amount upward that is donated so that I'm able to match a really generous donation at the end of all this for the North Texas Food Bank. Thank you so much for listening today.
that's a wrap for today. Until the next episode of the Food for Thought cast, make good food, eat good food, share it, and be kind to one another. Thanks so much for listening today. You are part of what makes us special, and we are so glad you joined us. Don't forget to rate, subscribe, and leave a review. Just like food, delicious podcasts are better when you share them with others. Come back for seconds wherever podcasts are served, and we'll catch you in the next episode of the Food for Thought cast. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at the Food for Thought cast or at www.foodforthoughtcast.com, where you can link to all podcast players, or you can send us an email at foodforthoughtcmc at gmail.com.